Welcome into the Online Enquirer podcast, live at State Farm Center, live on YouTube, and you can hear us on the Online Enquirer podcast. It's Jeremy Warner, Derek Piper, as Illinois gets a bounce back victory, ninety five to eighty five over Iowa. Didn't come easy, Derek, but they they pull away, and it felt fitting. Felt like a great storyline that. The guy who really struggled in the final 35 seconds at Penn State and that collapse, of course, not all on him. Everything that could go wrong went wrong, but bad sequence for him to end the game. He comes back and has a monster performance. Career-high 30 points for Coleman Hawkins. We'll get into the huge contributions from the bench, but Coleman at the end, final 315, 10 points and an assist. Helped Illinois close that one out. He responded, man. This Illinois team responded. The defense wasn't perfect, but it did feel like it had a little bit more intensity to it. What stood out to you about Coleman in a bounce-back performance for the Illini? Mature response. A guy that even after being part of the group that got ripped by Brad on the sideline there early in the second half, and we'll talk about that, came in and was really clutched on the stretch, made his free throws, got on the floor, had some steals that were – Really key uh, for an Iowa team to put up plenty of points today, but Illinois got some key stops there to, to really pull away. I mean, I think Iowa was up as many as seven there in the middle of the second half, and then obviously you get a double-digit win for Illinois. So uh, had to be able to, to close down possessions. If there was one thing I'd nitpick, it was rebounding. That I thought he could have done a little bit better. But, yeah, when you see the five steals, five assists, also had some turnovers, but uh, anytime you can – balance that out with the scoring that he had well was shooting with a lot of confidence from the very beginning uh in rhythm knocking down threes uh took opportunities to drive ben cricky too it's i think that when you look at the scouting report i'm sure it said not the most fleet of foot guy at 6'9 245 and and coleman got downhill and it was was able to do that too so uh and hearing him talk after the game uh it was interesting to hear him say that he had to delete some social media apps and and really cut down on his interactions and who he's listening to and everything. And I, it sounded like a guy that wore it like a man, like didn't avoid and duck the fact that he didn't play very well against Penn state. And that it, it did take a, a sit down with Brad Underwood that they had. And I know they didn't share any real specifics about that, but uh, for a four year guy that's been here, that knows what it takes to win in the big 10. And uh, I think you do appreciate that, Really, outside of last year, you know, that's the only time that Coleman's lost to Iowa. He's never lost to Michigan. You got some of these rivalries that Illinois is involved in that Coleman Hawkins hasn't taken very many L's in. So he was ready for this game, uh, and he did enough to make sure his team was in the win column. Yeah, and this is the Coleman we've seen for the last three months, right? Like that, the, Penn right. State has been basically an outlier. So uh, I understand the way that one ended. It was emotional for Illini fans, and I understand why they were angry <laughs> with some of the stuff that happened, some of the you know mindset concerns they had about Coleman Hawkins because we've seen that throughout his career. He's certainly not a perfect player, but that did take some mental toughness to bounce back from. Uh, and to start with 13 of the first 23 points for your team to end with 10 of the what last 16 or something like that for Illinois, uh, I thought was huge. I asked Brad Underwood after the game, because uh, Brad said growth maturity from Coleman Hawkins. I asked him what the last couple of days were like with Coleman. The second half. I was just thrilled with the way the first group played. I Oops, that's, that's the wrong This was growth and maturity for Coleman. Obviously, he's doing that throughout his career. But what did it look like the last couple of days? And what did, he, what did he show you? What did he tell you? Didn't say much, specifically. Got off social media, he said. Anybody want to check that? <laughs> um, yeah, um, all those conversations stay really private, but we had a really good, we had a real a, a get real conversation, and and I I'm really happy with him. I love his response. A year or two ago, I'm not sure that that would have been the response. Uh, I think it was beneficial. We had a pretty quick turnaround in a game. Um, but he practiced great, and it's just the correlation that happens with when the when the mind is right, and the mental approach is right. Uh, it was not at Penn State, quite simply not, and he knows that. But uh, uh, he also has to understand the impact that it has on everybody at this university, every fan, every teammate, and um, it's it's bigger than just him. And so he, I, I, I couldn't be happier. I thought Coleman was was just fantastic today. And Derek, we got to talk with Coleman afterwards, and I, I love talking with Coleman because he's real. Like he, he is real. He actually says stuff to us, and uh, he didn't sugarcoat anything that, uh, you know, 
it took some mental toughness from him, but he also had to get off maybe social media a little bit. I think that's smart of him. Like, I think you can have fun with those things, but uh, you got to be a pro too. And, you know, one of the fun parts of a guy that stays around for four years and Coleman's one of the few, right? He's the first Brad Underwood player who will stay through four years, partially because some guys are so good, but partially because of the transfer portal. Um, you get to see this maturity in, in real time, and it's not always the prettiest, but he's got a chance if he locks in mentally to leave with such a great legacy here uh, at Illinois. And I can see him being one of those guys in the NCAA tournament um, who people are like, God, he come, becomes a star in March Madness, right? And to – Terrence Shannon and Marcus Damas don't have great days today, but you got Coleman, another guy who can go for 20 plus, go for 30 like he did tonight. Um, that's why you can buy into a team is guys like that. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, Terrence is obviously the alpha, but to have someone as talented as Coleman to be an NBA type of player that is very experienced. Uh, and then, of course, Marcus Damas is fixing uh, into that mix too in terms of that supporting cast duo aside uh, with Terrence. And then you got a number of others that are really were able to contribute today. And, and I know we'll get to those, but certainly with Coleman's versatility, we know that we know his skill set, We know um, how smart of a player he is. And it was a mature response. It, it could have been a guy that let it linger a little bit and, and maybe took a talking with Brad the wrong way or didn't, you know, you know, what, however you want to talk about it. So uh, I think with social media uh, on that note, of course, anybody can do uh, what they, they want to. But I, I think it is a situation with him that maybe it allows you to be a little bit more steady. And, and the wins, you you don't get as as fed with the, the, the complacency stuff, the stuff that makes you feel good, the stuff that maybe makes you feel relaxed or, or whatnot. And you're, you're out there trolling Purdue when they lose or whatever. And then when you – when you lose and you don't play well, I mean, there's certainly a lot of toxicity that's out there. Um, and I can, people take it too far. I mean, let's, let's be honest for as bad as yeah. he played at Penn state. I, I, we saw it and I'm sure that he maybe saw some stuff too, that it's, it can't be good for you. So, um, right. When, when you troll people, you're inviting that into your world. Right. Like yeah. and, and you don't win and you don't perform, you're inviting that. So yeah, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure Brad Underwood's conversation had something to do with that. It's like, that stuff doesn't matter. Like, I, I know it can be fun, but you're also bringing in toxicity um, with that fun. Yes. And Illinois fans might like it when you're winning, but when you follow it up with that Penn State game, they're going to get after you for it, right? That's a fickle fan base. That's that's the roller coaster of a season. Like, that stuff doesn't matter. The stuff that matters is what happens on the court, what you do for your team. And tonight, he was able to set that stuff aside, and, and you see how good he is. Yeah, it, it makes you team focus. It, it takes away some of this, the self um, that, that can kind of not saying that he's that he's selfish or anything, but it is something that just attracts it, you know your mind, your attention away from what it is that should matter as a team and your effort and, and whatnot. So uh, I think it was a good move. Obviously, it was a good response. And, and here, this whole last few days, it was a quick turnaround. We've been wondering whether it was Brad pushing the buttons, whether it was the team soul searching, doing what they need to do internally to, to get the best out of themselves. It was good that Coleman was a good version of himself. Obviously it was good that Brad was able to, to find a button. And we'll talk about that here in the second half that really ignited a response and they get the win that obviously they, they needed. And it was an Iowa team that came in playing well and you saw what they can do offensively, which just penciling in every year. Fran McCaffrey's team can be one of the best in the country on offense. Yeah. All right. So Illinois had a 44-41 lead. And then Illinois had a lot of 7-0 run. The starters give up that uh, – starters and Amani Hansberry. Amani didn't make a good play uh, on that baseball pass that Sanford caught for a layup at the end of regulation. Then Iowa goes on a 5-0 run uh, to start the second half. Illinois misses four straight threes. Brad Underwood didn't like that. He didn't like the, the intensity on the uh, – glass at all so at 1809 mark of the second half line change goes the hockey line change terrence shannon marcus damas quincy garrier ty rogers coleman hawkins all out justin Harmon, luke goody dane danger nico moretti and amani hansbury come in and they kind of steadied the ship you saw some intensity you saw some mistakes some turnovers some missed shots uh but brad underwood used that bench and so anybody that says doesn't make adjustments, doesn't use the bench. Well, today he certainly did that, Derek, and it seemed to light a fire under him. And then, of course, Nico Moretti is probably the story of the game for a lot of Illini fans out there because nine points, a career high hits two threes to give Illinois the lead, and he was in the closing lineup. And he had, he had an actual point guard 
on the court at, at the end of the game and, and throughout the second half, 18 minutes for Nico Moretti. What did you see from him, Derek? Because he does give them certainly a different look, and we haven't seen him much uh, since he had his foot injury. An impressive amount of confidence, a guy that didn't look wide-eyed and uh, in terms of being scared or being, you know, not ready for the moment or anything like that. So for someone that has played so sparingly for a guy that's had an injury to be able to go out there in a big moment where it's not like Illinois had a 10 point lead and Brad was upset. And then guys are trying to, to preserve that it's, it's the middle of a, a battle, a dogfight, and Iowa was, was cooking offensively for the most part. I mean, they, they shot what 63% or, or thereabouts in the first half. And then it's early second half that Brad pulls those guys. So, for him to go out there, I actually thought we, we've talked – whenever someone's brought him up, I've mentioned that I don't know about him defensively. And I'd still – I think that's the weakest part of his game. But I thought he held his own. I, I thought mm-hmm. – uh, and it's not like he just is out there against just anybody. I mean, that's the top 15 offense in the country that he was able to to hold his own defensively. And then offensively to make shots the way he did with the three ball. Uh, he, of course, adds pace to the, the ball when it's in his hands to get out and transition to – to be able to penetrate. And I just think he he showed a lot of confidence. He showed some of his skill set, which is exciting still, uh, long-term, big big picture type of things as a point guard. So, uh, And then it, it does highlight the fact that while we haven't – you know, I think going in we thought that this year was going to be a lot about depth and a lot about different options and levers that Brad could pull. We really have seen a, a fairly short rotation in contrast to what we kind of expected – but it does show that he can go in different directions. It does show the talent that's on this entirety of the roster. So Miko's a, a very capable guy offensively in particular. And man, it was impressive that he was right that Brad was riding with him late into that game and he deserved it. He deserved it. Yeah, I did not have 18 minutes, nine points, two of two from three for Nico Moretti. Um, his first two three pointers of his entire career did not had one turnover, the one on the sideline there, one assist. Did have three fouls, but I gotta say, two of the fouls I thought were ticky tack. And Iowa had uh some ticky tack fouls as well that Fran McCaffrey we... was pretty <sighs> upset about. That was that was such a tight second half like all the points were basically at free throws at one point it's a physical big 10 game um and i thought this was a a pretty good crew with dorsey and um high knees jeffrey anderson in in here but um they they were calling ticky tack fouls both ways i didn't like it i hate it it's soft and it changes the way that games get called in the first half of the second half and then you you make one bad call and it it gets shown on the video board you go talk to the the coach who tells you it was terrible. Then there's the makeup and there's like the makeup to the makeup and it's just back and forth. It just sets the the bar of any then kind of contact is anticipated as a foul. And then it just gets, get, it gets called really tight and you really obstruct the flow of the game. So uh, it was still a good. And what was game. it? What was a great flow game, right? Like the, right. the pace of this one was just, I had to sit there and take a breath for a second because I was pushing it in transition on made shots, Illinois just coming down and getting good looks. It was just, it was such a fun kind of un. it was like a big 12 game, right? Like the big 10 doesn't mm-hmm. get the kind of uh, you know notoriety for offense, but these two teams, two great offenses and two defenses that are, you know, not very good right now. And we'll talk about Illinois defense today, but um, I thought, I thought it was great. And I thought Nico helped push that pace, but another guy I want to shout out, that we're probably not focusing enough on is, is Justin Harmon. Another huge bounce back game for him. He didn't play the first 16 minutes of this game, Derek. Uh, and then he was as important as anyone not named Coleman Hawkins in that second half. Finishes with 12 points, got to the free throw line, finished at the rim, and just some huge rebounds. Just some massive rebounds to help flip this game late in the game um, to help Illinois you know, get some stops, which they got a bunch of stops in a row there. Uh, I thought he was fantastic off the bench. We'll get no Monty Hansberry, but Dane Danger gave some good minutes, eight rebounds for him. He was the toughest on the interior, just missed some bunnies. Um, he, he's got to find a way to finish. He was three of seven, uh, missed both all three of his free throws, so that hurt. But uh, getting those veterans to contribute off the bench was, was huge. And just as much as Hawkins, I thought Harmon had a bounce back after giving up, what, five back cuts in the last game? Very important for him to to click into place as far as that goes. And I, I was encouraged. I, I noticed that at some point in the first half as it's playing out, when you got Illinois scoring, and, and sometimes you 
sometimes we can be maybe too much of the the body language uh, experts, but he's a guy that's up cheering when you know something's good happening. He hasn't checked in. He's not playing his normal role. So he was bought in, um, obviously, as far as the team goes. And then when he gets his opportunity, just made some big plays, made some big baskets. Uh, he is someone that can get into the teeth of a defense and finish at the rim and absorb some contact and everything. So, uh, yeah, it was it was bad for him the other night. Not only I think offensively he's he's had some stretches where he's not the best uh, as far as the impact that he's giving, and then defensively it was it was really alarming. So it sounded like Brad mentioned too that he's been on him of late and and really let him know how displeased he was with that effort. Uh, in state college. And then Justin came back and responded like a veteran should, like you expect him yep. to do. So, uh, and then Dane, I, I, Dane deserves a shout out. It's gotta be hard for someone to keep that mental focus and, and understand that you're not playing nearly the role that you thought, not even nearly the role you played last year, but to uh, when your number's called, you, you go out there. And I know that early he got, he got pulled early because he wasn't blocking out Owen Freeman. And I'm sure Dane maybe even wondered in his mind, like, well, I get another chance uh, because he maybe because Amani's coming because Amani's coming. Coming. coming the way he was playing. Yeah, right. But he does get that opportunity, and I just I thought Dane was active. I like that he had the rebounds, had a, a poke away or two with his with his hands, and then I, I liked his moves inside. He just didn't finish off a couple of them. So um, it's a guy that hasn't played a a long, consistent stretch of game reps. You do have to make those shots if you want to continue to get those opportunities. But it was good for Dane to get those. And you play, you match their – Iowa plays a bigger lineup with Freeman and, and Cricky together. And Illinois was happy to match that, both with Coleman and Amani playing a little together and then also Dane and uh, Amani as well. So I thought it was good. Yeah. Um, Amani, I, I couldn't be higher on him for, for his – I know he's your guy, Derek. The, the guy, <laughs> Piper's guy they actually landed. Um, I, I just love him because defensively he is the loudest – in drop coverage, like among Dane Coleman, he is just the loudest. He's barking. Uh, he's tough. He's physical. You just know what you're going to get out of him every time he hits the court. And it might not always be the prettiest. You know, he might get oversized at times, overpowered at times, but he's just going to battle. And Brad said he's the biggest trash talker since Io DeSumo that they've had for a freshman. He just does some things that aren't very freshman like. Derek, and, and you think about what that is as he progresses, as he builds, as he gets bigger, better, and gets more opportunity. Um, he, he's just showed a lot, and four points, four rebounds tonight. He's got to get better offensively. I think that'll come with time, but you play that defense, you give that effort on the glass, he's going to be a, a big time player in, in this program. And, you know, I, I thought it was great that you could go to him today. If you need energy, you know, you can go to Imani Hansberry as your ninth or tenth guy at some point. We've been talking about Amani for a while uh, at Inquire for sure. And you're, as the Illini fans are seeing more and more of him, you're seeing more and more of why Brad and the staff just absolutely had to have him. As he was showing out on the EYBL circuit, and, and it was clear that he was someone that they just, from an intangible standpoint, from a toughness standpoint, was someone that they just they loved and offensively skilled too. I think there's still more, obviously, that he can show there. And, and he does need to develop some things in terms of his strength, but also uh, I think his touch around the basket can get a little bit better. It's a challenge going against this athleticism and size that he's going to see uh, at the high major level in the Big Ten. But, man, he plays hard. And that was one thing, too, is communication. When I first saw him, those first couple of, of games, I think I was down in, uh, in Louisville or Memphis. I can't remember exactly which one. But just the way he talks, it, it feels like, I mean, as he gets older and he, maybe even as soon as next year, it could be a, a real leader on your team uh, and just because he's he directs traffic he's he's communicating he's passionate he's he's a guy that people want to play with and and will follow his lead i think so uh love his toughness loves his activity he had a great challenge one thing that you know illinois doesn't do a ton of is is kind of help defense and and rotations and whatnot but patrick mccaffrey i forget who he burnt by but he went by somebody body came over contested challenge didn't foul and then got out in transition and ran and Damask hit him on a bounce pass where his defense was rewarded then for a transition basket so he's playing like that and the opportunities need to keep coming and I think they will 
Yeah, Iowa 11 of 18 on layups today. That's an improvement for Illinois. That's been giving up layup lines here recently. Here's Brad Underwood with his uh, what ended up being a master stroke with his line change. Into the second half. I was just thrilled with the way the first group played. I was so excited about you know us not getting on the floor and and uh, giving up rebounds and and um, I, I I I had seen enough with that group and and. Um, um, their butt needed to find the bench and and they needed to they needed to understand um it's not acceptable and and playing time is not is not a given thing just because you average this or you've been out there and um i've said it we've got a really good team and i couldn't be prouder that it, it worked today <laughs> but um I've made a lot of line changes over the years in, in different in different ways, and but I also had a lot of confidence in in, in what what that group can do because I see them every day. And Derek, there was a point I looked at you and said, "Okay, now might be the time to, to get rid of this line change because it was going on a little too long." And eventually, Brad Underwood might have gone a, one possession too long, but I think the message was received, right? Like Coleman came back. I, I thought Terrence's defense on Tony Perkins was pretty dang good today, uh, and I want to get in the defense here, but. No, it did work. It did work for them. But we were really interested to see what would happen defensively. At the end of the game, Illinois gives up 1.19 points per possession. Uh, give up 85 points, 80 plus points in five of six straight games, or five of six games, uh, Derek, for this Illini defense. What did you see tonight? Was there any improvement in your eyes? I think there was. Uh, at one point when you're seeing Iowa score, I mean, they – they were hovering around the the 1.5 and and north, kind of like 15 minutes into the game, points per possession and shooting 60 plus percent from the field. That it wasn't super encouraging. I, I do think that some of that was Iowa just making shots and, and some tough ones, but also there were some breakdowns of I think transition defense is still something this team needs to address. Iowa, of course, plays with a lot of pace. I didn't like Illinois really at the rim. I, I thought that. Coleman could have been tougher and, and better inside. Uh, Cricky was hurt in Illinois uh, on some of the back downs and finishes. So they're at the at the bucket defense. I thought wasn't the best, and they were giving up some offensive boards to a team that it's not really their mo. Um, offense in terms of rebounding, like Iowa hung with Illinois when really that's not what they do. So uh, there are some things to clean up for sure. But I think that I was really encouraged by yes, Terrence on the ball against Perkins, fighting through screens, making things tough. I thought that was great. I thought Damask on the note of fighting through screens, like Peyton Sanford had two shot attempts until that very late home run pass that they threw. And that's a lot of credit because he he's almost like J.J. Reddick sometimes, running off every screen, constantly moving. He never stops to take a breath. And he can also back cut you. He'll, he'll look and see if you're playing up too far on him and, and try to slip and back cut. So uh, – the mass, I thought, on the whole, did a pretty darn good job on him. So when you look at 80, like, give it, go, give 80 up to Iowa. Don't give 80 up to Maryland or Penn State. Like, those are teams that are at That's the right. bottom of the Big Ten in offense. Iowa's towards the top. I'm not saying it was perfect because it wasn't, and there's still some things that they can clean up, but it, it was better. And I think the energy, for the most part, was, was better, in particular when you needed the stops later in the second half. That's when you, you definitely got more of that production. Yeah, Iowa shot 62% in the first half. They shot 35% in the second half. And at one point, they missed eight straight shots. Uh, and I didn't think, like, the shot quality was all that different than the first half, uh, except for those kind of offensive rebound putbacks. Um, I thought Illinois' defense forced tough shots in that first half. A lot of tough twos, and I thought Joshua Dix was awesome. Like, he just made some really tough shots. Tony Perkins made some tough shots. Um, it's a really good offensive team, but – by the end of the day, Tony Perkins was 5 of 14. You'll take that. Uh, Peyton Sanford, 3 of 11. Surely you will take that. Um, Patrick McCaffrey, 1 for 5. So uh, I thought they forced Iowa into the shots they wanted. Iowa, 4 of 12 from 3. This is a team that can just light you up from 3. So you did that, and in the second half, I thought your at-the-rim defense was was much better, part because of Monty, but I just thought the team defense – was a little bit better in that second half. And Cricky getting in foul trouble uh, certainly helped with that. You kind of took Freeman out of this game in the second half. Uh, so I just thought your, your defense was better today. I, I just thought the intensity, the effort, the focus was better. And they didn't switch as much today, Derek. And I think that just makes people more accountable. 
<laughs> when you when you don't switch, it's like we know who is guarding Peyton Sanford, Marcus Damask. Like we know who's guarding Tony Perkins, Terrence Shannon. I just thought those guys um, battled more. It, it was clear when you're watching it. The switching does. We've kind of mentioned it before. It does kind of pass off some of the accountability, or just maybe creates a little bit of a passive nature when, when you're. Your job is to prevent this guy from scoring. It's your job to get through the screens and cut off his driving lanes. There, there is something that there's an urgency and a, a level of energy that you have to give to be able to to make that happen. So, uh, Tony Perkins, we saw he can be a mid range menace. He was in Iowa City, and that early in the early in the mid part of the first half, I was like, oh, we're going to see this again because he had it, he had it going. Some of them, some of those were tough. Um, yeah, Josh Dix did that same thing to Wisconsin. You know, he had 17 points, a lot of it mid-range pull-up. He's been a really efficient offensive player for them. and Their he, development he was, is awesome. Like, I, is. they're not getting highly ranked guys. And, and Fran, offensively especially, I mean, the guys they've developed, like Sanford turning into an all-Big Ten player. We know the Murray brothers. And um, Perkins is one of those guys, too. Luca Garza. Um, he, he does a fantastic job of developing some underrated guys. No doubt. Yeah, it's it's crazy because the, their recruiting rankings aren't super cra- up there in terms of the the stars. And I mean, Luca was what a three star out of Washington D.C. And I don't know what the Murray twins were ranked. They weren't highly touted coming out of high school either. But they run a system that that highlights their strengths too. Because this does this team while they can shoot. I mean, Sanford leads the Big Ten and three point makes for a reason. And Dix is making threes, and uh, they have some guys that can really go from the outside they're taking less threes this year they're playing more inside the arc which you saw today i mean they they like to play through owen freeman a decent amount and he's really come on this year but sanford can can cut and get to the rim and obviously perkins in the mid-range and all all the way at the rim too so uh fran just they, they play with great pace they have a lot of offensive freedom and flow that um makes it pretty fun basketball to watch they don't defend a whole lot but um you know that's just kind of their style and Luckily, Illinois outscored them today. Yeah, just a a few more things. Terrence Shannon, 12 points uh, today, 4 of 10 shooting. I wanted to get him more touches uh, in that second half. I felt like Illinois could turn the game, and he finally got one on a layup. Just kind of sitting in the corner. Iowa really wanted to take away the dribble drive, so they were trying to take him away, and I thought Coleman took advantage of that with the great matchups he had against Cricky, against Owen Freeman, just took those guys off the bounce. But – uh, two of seven from three, just try to shoot over that zone. I just think be in aggression mode for him, he, even with some of the defense they're playing. Quincy Garrier had a really good first half. Nine points, uh, had some ferocity at the rim, that dunk over Perkins. Hadn't seen anything like that in a while. He actually went up and stole a rebound from Imani Hansberry at one point, but it was a putback for him, and that's the tenacity you need. Uh, it wasn't great in the second half and really didn't get back in that game as – Amani Hansberry was playing so well, um, but there was just a good sign from from Quincy Garrier as well uh, for a bounce back performance. Uh, but what would you make of, of Terrence Shannon Jr. in offense? I'm not going to make a big deal in, in a game where he scored 95, Derek, but it was just um, kind of sitting in the corner a little bit today. Yeah, I didn't love it. The fact that I think through the first 30 minutes of the game or thereabouts, he'd only taken one, two and two free throw attempts during that stretch. Iowa, you do give credit for being able to cut off some driving lanes and and use some of that congestion in the paint. They did a good job. I was going back and going for my preview. I think he only scored 11 points against Iowa in Iowa City last year. I thought they did a good job, really, of this is a different Illinois team because last year the whole scout was clog the lane, clog the lane, make them shoot threes. They couldn't do it. This team's a better three-point shooting team. But I did think Illinois settled from three a little bit too much. I think Terrence was part of that. Uh, And then – uh, but ultimately, yeah. And then there were times, too, that maybe Illinois didn't do a good job of identifying, hey, we need to get the ball to Terrence. We need to run something for Terrence. That was later in the games kind of popping up in, in our heads as we're sitting there courtside. Uh, Quincy, it was, it was nice to go back in the time machine a little bit there in the in the first half and say, all right, that's the guy in January that we were loving on and saying maybe he's an all-conference dude. He's a double-double machine mm-hmm. becoming that. And um, – like the the going up and ripping one from Amani was super aggressive put back that those were plays he was making with pretty much regular regularity earlier in the season. And yeah, the dunk was a nice he's he's a athletic, strong dude that when he's fully engaged can can help you obviously at both ends of the floor. So 
nice flash from him. Uh, didn't play a, a ton down the stretch, but that's just kind of – I think that's honestly a, a good thing. Just the, the dynamic of Brad making that line change. It showed the starters that, you know, it wasn't like the – the the bench rotation was just getting crushed and they had to get thrown back in. It was like, hey, you know, we got some guys that can hold their own. If you're not going to bring it on a given night, Ty was making some mistakes defensively, wasn't super disciplined. He got benched and didn't come in uh, at the end. It, it shows that the bench can actually be a, a tool for some accountability. And and it was good. Not everybody's going to be happy. Uh, and Quincy, right. like you said, was good in the first half. But Brad used that well today. Yeah, we got almost 400 people live on the YouTube channel. Appreciate you guys. Hit the like button while you're here, notifications bell, uh, and subscribe to us. A lot of people ask why this guy didn't get so many minutes. Why this guy didn't get so many minutes. It's like, well, Brad put the right people on the floor at the end of the game. And this is where you depth shines. The fact that you could put Dane in over Quincy Garrier and Dane played well uh, in the second half for the most part. The fact that you can put in a Nico Moretti over a Ty Rogers and, and you can still play well. Um, what do you think comes of this? Derek, like, what is the long-term impact of this? Because I still think your five starters, Justin Harmon, Luke Goody, uh, are probably the guys getting the most minutes. So what is the the lasting impact of that line change and of seeing the bench perform like it did today? Hopefully urgency, hopefully accountability, and hopefully confidence for the guys that are on the bench in case there's foul trouble, in case there's the need to pull that rip cord and somebody's not bringing it or some somebody's struggling and having an off night and you just need something different. The great thing is there are different attributes that guys on that bench bring to the table. Like Dane, I thought is someone that you can go to and run your offense through a little bit. You can get him those post touches. If he finishes two more of those, which very capable there sometimes he got he got Owen Freeman like either in the air or off balance, had him beat, just didn't make it. We know he can finish at a little bit more of a, of a decent rate as he's shown in the past. So he can do that. Amani, of course, is going to be the junkyard dog, um, can play as a small, smaller ball five, um, depending on who you're going against, but also compare a little bit with Coleman, uh, Coleman at the five or Amani at the four, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. But uh, you're, you're not going to be wondering about grit and intensity when Amani's on the floor. And then obviously Nico just kind of brings that pace offensively and, if he's going to challenge on defense, I mean, he's physically he's not very strong. Like he is, he is slender and still needs the weight room for sure. But he he plays with a an emotion. He played with an emotion today and a, and a, a toughness that was impressive. It, it's something I didn't necessarily know that you get that out of him. Yeah, because I and he had Sanford like backing him down at times. I thought he forced right. some some tougher shots and some of his contests today. I. He had two fouls on him. I didn't think they were actually fouls. So um, that might have been as big as anything, because if you can trust him to just not kill you defensively. Now, I don't know if I believe that yet. Um, so yes. that's that's what we got to yeah. see here it's coming up. But, you know, you do have a ripcord, like you said, like that you can just if no one else is giving you anything and you need somebody to, to bring the ball up and get you an offense and break down a defense and get the ball moving and humming, uh, Nico Moretti potentially can do that. And I, I just think the confidence that this gives him, that this gives the staff in him, that this gives Imani Hansberry and maybe even a Justin Harmon, I think that's the lasting thing is that can't be easy, Derek, to do what Nico Moretti did coming into today not playing basically over the last month, not scoring a bucket, I think, in the last month, and to play most of the second half and come up with huge plays. They had two huge clutch threes like that. That's That tells me something about the kid, um, and, and that's great for, during, for now and in the future. Take some some real discipline, um, some mental toughness, obviously, and um, a guy that has skills for sure. So uh, we've seen in, in prior years, it did make me think a little bit, I know his name is kind of taboo, but Brandon Podjimski at Northwestern. Uh, R.J. Melendez certainly as a freshman had his moments. Luke Goody in the tournament, yeah. Luke, Luke Goody too, yep. So, uh, even that, and that was kind of more – I think that's more relatable versus last year where you had to play freshman. You had to play Epps. You had to play Rodgers. You're starting Sky Clark. Those guys, that group of, of freshmen, and even you can go to – Coleman's year with with him and, and I know Corbello was off the bench that you're on it you're getting incorporated into a really good team with veterans and then you've got to earn it and maybe 
the the consistency of seeing those opportunities isn't there. But yeah, for someone that went through the injury, um, when he start the light started to come on, albeit against some really low major opponents, but it just felt like Illinois was going in the direction of getting him more in the rotation and giving him those chances. Then he has the foot, and then now he's back and had that chance today, and he he capitalized on it. Now I think the the interesting part of it is there have been times I think against maybe more athletic teams. I wonder about him defensively with the, the blow by stuff. And there have been times where he went in early. Uh, the Michigan game was one of those where I'm like, why is DGL not getting that? Because yeah. DGL defensively, I trust more. Offensively, he's not been efficient as a shot maker. Maybe DGL now is, you know, motivated to go and practice. I think everybody should be motivated at this point because you're you're really you can coach showed you the, can play it. Yeah. Yeah. You can and you can see the the sand of the hourglass going down now. You you know that the time is is of the essence, and you're about to be in postseason play, and you want to be in the rotation. You, you gotta you gotta bring it. You gotta bring it. So I think that that was great on a, a variety of of fronts today. Coleman Hawkins, by the way, during conference play, fourteen point three points per game. Derek shooting forty one percent from three, thirty one of seventy five from three during conference play. I just want to bring that up. All right, good. Derek. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's been pretty dang good uh, for the most part. That's why it was nice to see him bounce back. Um, Illinois now has a game lead for second place in the Big Ten over both Wisconsin and Northwestern. They have a two-game lead with four games remaining for a double bye in the Big Ten tournament. Obviously, two games back at Purdue with four games left uh, for both those teams. But I, I don't want to mess miss the chance to talk about Another milestone for Brad Underwood, five straight 20-win seasons, five straight winning seasons in the Big Ten. I remember five, six years ago, Derek, me looking at you after some some bad losses and teams that just weren't very good and saying, someday we are covering good teams, and it'll all pay off. All our work. I kept telling you that. Someday we'll cover good teams. Brad Underwood has given Illinois fans really good teams for the five straight years. Um, So we can talk about the relative things that we're – concerned about all these little things, but Illinois, somebody said today, I, let me find it. Um, now we can say that we've clinched a tournament berth. Yeah. Illinois is going to the NCAA tournament for, for another year, even if they lose out in the regular season in the big 10 tournament, uh, they have a good enough resume. They, they have enough big 10 wins and quality wins to do that. But five straight 21 seasons hasn't happened since 2000 to 2007. Haven't had five straight winning big 10 seasons since 99 to 07. That was a golden era. The 80s was the last time before that. That was a golden era. This is a consistently competitive, really good Big Ten team. No Big Ten team has won more games over the last five years. So I understand all the pressure that is on March, but zooming out, this program is really, really relevant in the Big Ten. It's relevant nationally. And Brad Underwood keeps getting bites at the apples. We'll we'll see what they make of it once they get to March. Uh, But every time, you have a chance and you have a good team every year under Brad Underwood the last five years. Agree with all that. Consistency is hard. Like even really good coaches are having a, a tough time with it. Tom Izzo at, at Michigan state's a good example here recently. <laughs> Jawan Howard, Indiana. Uh, Jawan Howard, Indiana. Yes. Ohio state. Those are, those are good jobs. That is- so don't just don't take it for granted. Right. And I, I don't think a lot of people do, but your problems change, right? Your problems go from how do we get in the tournament every year to how do we go far? How do we win a Big Ten championship? But those are way better problems than some of your peers are having right now. Absolutely. Yeah, and I was looking at Matt Painter's resume, and he had a stretch of earlier in his career at Purdue, six straight, uh, to be able to – six straight 20 wins, then a little bit of a gap, and then five straight. So, uh you know, it's hard to to really string those together for a prolonged time when you've got you now and now we're in a totally different era. We're in an era of maximum roster turnover. And Illinois has not been one of those, oh, well, they're they're the exception. They got great retention and nobody leaves and everybody's happy and, and whatnot. Like that doesn't happen. And look, when you're on a, when you have really good teams, then there's gonna be guys that don't crack the rotation and they've seen that. And Brad hasn't use that as an excuse to say, oh, well, you know, we were in a great position, but then Andre Carballo left and didn't pan out. Or, oh, well, you know, insert, you know, Epps, Cy Clark, whatever, what have you. So they've been able to pivot. They've been able to go on the portal, use that as an asset. They've obviously had Brad be able to establish 
a culture here that that, that works that is carried over. Uh, obviously, last year was disappointing, but even in a, a disappointing year, Down you won here. twenty games and you were a nine seed and you went to the tournament. So like that that shows the standards being raised. And I loved Brad's answer uh, as far as appreciating the consistency, but also saying Illinois basketball should be here. But the thing is, that. like they didn't have you know for a long time post 2005 Illinois was not where they should be or a lot of times not even close and now he has them there the last five years the best programs most consistent programs in the Big Ten are Illinois Purdue Wisconsin like Michigan State's a tier below them here in the last five years Michigan we've seen highs but now we see these kind of lows like Maryland we've seen highs and lows um Ohio State man like I, I thought Chris Holtman was going to have this as a top five program and now two years uh, of bad years and, he, and he's gone Indiana uh, that's a program that should have as high as standards as anybody like if Mike Woodson comes back for a fourth year what are you telling your fan base there if, if Juwan Howard comes back for another year at Michigan what are you telling your fan base meanwhile Brad Underwood saying yeah we should be doing this uh, and I, I invite that pressure. I, I loved what he said today about that, that we should be doing this at Illinois. Like he's brought that bravado back. He ain't perfect. We know that we can pick apart things, but in this transfer portal era to be able to reload, like he does to be able to get winning teams with different players uh, and to build it out of what it was, what we were covering five, mm-hmm. six years ago, Derek, um, I don't think it should go. Um, I, I don't think it should go overlooked or people should be ungrateful for it because, uh, today's atmosphere was special, right? Like the pain of Penn State is there because you have such high expectations. Now you don't expect Illinois to do those things anymore. So kudos to Brad Underwood. He's had a hell of a run here. A hundred percent. And I was thinking back, them getting just annihilated by Iowa in some Big Ten tournament games and just non-competitive. And like they were, they weren't close. Like after two years, they weren't, all that close. I know that they had some good recruiting wins. The fact that they had Io come in, and we knew Trent was a good player, obviously uh, with Kofi. But what he took over, I mean, that first roster and whatnot was was pretty tough. And it, there was just a, it, it felt insurmountable to to bring this back to like, oh, well, the best stretch since the early two thousands. Like that that seemed re- really really far away. And yes, right. the the tournament run has to be there, but they're in position to to make one of those. They have a roster that's talented enough to make one of those. And, um, and can, I, can I be honest with you? This Big Ten I know is not, especially this year, this Big Ten the last five years has been better than it was in the early 2000s because it was Illinois and Michigan yeah. State, right, at that time? It's much deeper. It's much deeper. Like, it, it is so much harder. Uh, you know, maybe some of the top teams are a little bit better and more consistently, but – Michigan State, Illinois were at the top there. Wisconsin was really, really good. Devin Harris and Bo Ryan's teams. But, uh, man, just every night is 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 a grind and is a battle. You know, Indiana's the third worst Big Ten team, and they're 6-10 and 10 right now, right? Like Penn State, Minnesota, Nebraska are not pushovers anymore. So I, I think that's more of a credit to what he's doing in, in this era where everyone's got good players. Everyone's got good coaches in this league now for the most part. They certainly do. Yeah, no, I mean, they're, I thought Fran put it well today saying there's there's no off nights in the Big Ten. That's not the same in a lot of leagues to this day. It wasn't the same at, at different points, obviously, in, in previous years. So, and I, on the note of Wisconsin, I like there's a Bo Ryan-ness to Illinois where you can put them in the top five of the league pretty much every year of late. Yes, Bo Ryan got to a couple Final Fours. So you got to get there, but that was, you know, after some time at, at Wisconsin for Bo Ryan, but th- that's really the the one thing that removes him from being one of the top coaches in college basketball. I think like the consistency's there. And look, I, I know you know depending on the mood of this podcast, and not really, I'm t- talking more about the fan base. After Penn State, there's is Brad and we're going to get fired if they d- get bounced yeah. in the first round, and then they they win today. It's like you know Brad's Brad's awesome uh, and all this kind of stuff, but. Yeah, well, I mean, it's been like the last three years, Derek, we're sitting here going, Brad Underwood's legacy is all about whether they win in the first, whether they get to a sweet 16 or not. And it's a huge part of it. It's, it's yeah. sitting there like that. That is the one thing he does not have. But like I think about it, if he gets to an elite eight or final four, I think he can get, to, I think Brad's got that Lou Henson territory. Like if he just stuck here and got to made a couple runs and had Illinois for a decade, be one of the best teams in the big 10, like that's that's what Lou Henson did. 
right? And Lou Henson had an Elite Eight and a Final Four, only one Big Ten championship. But, um, you know, like I, I think Brad's got that capability. And when you zoom out, I think it's you, you appreciate it a little bit more. No doubt. Yeah, a run, especially a deep one. Of course, Final Four speaks for itself. But uh, Pat Painter has done it for a long time. Of course, he's won a couple of Big Ten championships. But what is it, one elite? One elite one eight elite appearance eight. for him? Carson, Carson Edwards, yeah. Yeah, Ryan Klein. Who was God, not, by the was... way, an, an All Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year, um, which was wrongly announced at Mackey Arena. We were there. That what, what, was the the game, what was the game? Did they win that one where Carson Edwards just went off, and it was one of the yeah. greatest games in tournament history? That that year was was fantastic. But yeah, you need if you get one of those runs, like I, that's all people want. Like, I, and I think Brad Underwood approval rating just goes through the roof, and it's amazing. You know, just that that one run uh, that three games in a row or four games in a row can, can change it all. Right. No, I thought, I know that I think Joey or I think Joey's going to write it about just kind of the 20 win and Coleman had a great answer. Coleman had a great answer in terms of just the appeal that Illinois basketball now has in comparison to when he was a recruit. And certainly it took some ball rolling in the right direction, getting some talent, having a vision that people could actually see to jump on board then. But now that, you know, people are legitimately excited. Like Coleman said, I'm using his his words to get an Illinois offer to be recruited by Illinois. You know, the fact that you've got guys from in the state that are taking Illinois really, really seriously. That you know, a Marez Johnson, um, you know, Jeremiah, Jeremiah Peters, Peters. is from the state. Like th- those type of of names and talents and in that echelon, and I would assume, of course, they weren't coming to Illinois. Um, th- those were ones that were really, really hard to get. So. You do appreciate that. And that also shows the guys that we're talking about, the fact that you got them, puts you in a position to have some sustainability. And that's what's yep. been great to see with them. You've always wanted yeah. that consistency, envied it out of Michigan State, envied it out of Wisconsin, envied it out of Purdue for the most part. And barring the uh, – needing the tournament run. But outside of that, like to be in the mix every year at the top echelon of the league is – Pretty good spot to be. All right, let's get to a few questions on the live YouTube channel. Send those in. We'll get to a few before we get out of here. Chris, why does it feel like we get every team's best shot week in and week out, regardless of how we play? It's because you got number 12 in front of your name. It's because you're the, one of the best teams in the in the country. Like You're one of the highest-ranked teams. You're a quad one opportunity. Iowa, this could have been their third straight quad one win today. So they were highly motivated. Penn State, highly motivated. Uh, and that team's playing better. They, they beat Indiana pretty handily today. Uh, at home today so yeah that that's part of being good that's part of what we're talking about when when you're good like these players now Derek these recruits these players at other programs they now see Illinois the same way maybe players 10 years ago uh, maybe not Michigan State because Tom Izzo has got that that aura but how they see Wisconsin how they see uh, some of these top programs Purdue like Illinois is thought of as that way right now so you're going to get your best shot yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, anybody that still has anything left to play for in their season is going to see it as a massive opportunity to get a win that that really carries a lot of weight. I know Iowa thought that coming in for sure. And they, just on the whole for them, it's a situation where they've been playing a lot better. Uh, and for whatever reason, I love it. You know, it's just, this matchup is as fun as any uh, in the, the course of a year over the last handful, obviously. These, these two just know how to play great, entertaining, fun basketball games. They're high scoring usually. They're, they're tense for the most part. Um, maybe their coaches border on getting technicals or do get one. There was none, none today. All the friend was pushing it. But, yeah, so I, I think that that – and then, you know, Maryland, you're, you're playing a reunion type of game. You're playing a – you got one of those for Michigan State. You got a unique matchup with, with Penn State with the venue. You're doing that you, – you want draws – in terms of the opponent for those games. And That's it right. says something that you're one of those draws. Yeah, to you, Purdue, right? Like, you know, that's probably the two programs they're doing right now. Uh, let's see, Philip asks, why did Illinois not seriously pursue Owen Freeman? They did for a while, Derek. They offered, they recruited him, uh, but they, they just went a different direction. So, weigh in on that. Yeah, I know that offensively skilled was, was really the thing that, that drew Illinois and pretty much half of the Big Ten to offer him summer after his sophomore year and it was by the way just just sorry to interrupt but from bradley bourbonnet 
high yep. school. Now yep. I can't keep County. Then went to Moline, right, uh, yep. for his last couple of years to play with Brock Harding, who yep. was his Iowa teammate. That's right. Yeah, so – he was still at Bradley Bourbon when Illinois offered, when some other Big Ten schools got in there, obviously Iowa being one of those. He played at one of the high school events in the summer during June. I uh, can't remember Riverside Brookfield or there was another one that, there, that was going on and just wasn't very impressive. Um, I think he was playing in Normal. I know that Joey Wagner yes. and I saw him over there. Uh, normal Community and Normal West, one of those. And he just – he wasn't very assertive, didn't know – if he was physically tough enough for the Big Ten, and I know he's he's still at that point was two had two full years left of high school. I'm just speaking from what I saw and from what I think from Illinois standpoint. I think from some other Big Ten teams, I think Indiana, Ohio State, he had made the the run of visits and got a lot of of attention and offers from the Big Ten. But uh, Illinois at that point, after seeing him that summer, didn't really they took their foot off the gas. They didn't prioritize him as a as a guy that they needed to have. Um, Iowa st- stayed on him because, you know, they they love the offensive capabilities and they got him. So it uh, looks like a, a good eval and good uh, stick to it uh, as far as Fran goes. And I know in hindsight, maybe now Illinois would like to have him, but that was just kind of the, the mentality at the time. And you can't get all of them. I know it's from Illinois. Yeah, right. um, you got Imani. You got Marez Johnson coming in. Like, you're going to be okay. Like, you're going to be okay there. Um Let's see. Ryan says, with four games left, how much do you think the defense can be improved before the season starts? As we talked about, I thought the defense was was actually better today. I know Iowa scores 85 points. We, we went over that, but I thought Illinois forced them into really tough shots, and I thought their their bite was there. I just thought they were more intense, more focused. Taking out the switches meant you didn't have as many errors, like just bu- complete bust. There was one baseline out of bounds play, I think there was. Uh, but it's just getting a little bit better. Like we, we did our chain yeah, mail, Derek. Right. It's, it's not like you have to be all of a sudden a top 20 defense in the country. I'm not expecting that, and they don't need that with how good their offense is. You just got to be a little bit better. You got to be more competitive. And what we saw against Penn State and giving up that 80 points to Maryland, like those aren't good offensive teams. Like teams shouldn't be doing that to you. You should have more pride and more tenacity than that. For sure. Yeah. And uh, even though we liked the response, I think they did play with more energy. We went over some of the improvements that they made. I, there's still some areas that they can clean up, obviously. When I mean, you give up 85, you, you do have some things that you need to address still. I don't know. You know, They still have a ways to go in uh, needing a larger sample size to say, hey, this is an average defensive team of late. Like I know that the metrics – on the whole of the season would put you in that category when you're kind of ranked in the, the 50 range. And if they can be average in thereabouts, maybe teetering over, obviously you hope with an elite offense, that team can go far like that. Mm-hmm. That team can definitely go far. Um, do they have good individual defenders? Absolutely. Terrence is a really good defender. Um, you've got, you've got Coleman who's got some really elite skill sets within his defense. So, um, how much can it get better? I would, I'd like to see it against a, a team, you know, as you go forward, like a Purdue, or like a Wisconsin, you got some tough tests. Um, we'll see what happens in Minnesota. They're not a, a pushover uh, anymore. Yep. So uh, Iowa with their pace, Iowa with their, their ability to score offensively, they'll, they'll put up these type of numbers against a lot of people. And Illinois obviously wants to play fast too. So you get some inflated numbers there, but um, thought it was better step in the right direction, but, definitely needs to continue to have that bite and, and get better. All right, Derek, looking at the last four games over the last two weeks of the regular season here, you got Minnesota at home. Again, not a pushover. They're not as good on the road as most teams in the Big Ten. Uh, and Illinois is taking care of business at home for the most part. They're now 7-1 uh, and one at home uh, during Big Ten play. But then you go at Wisconsin. That's a quad one opportunity. Home against Purdue, quad one opportunity. At Iowa, quad one opportunity. If you get three of those, I feel like you have a chance to – maybe get to a three seed if you maybe win a game or two in the Big Ten tournament. Um, if you win two of those, I, I think you're probably going to be on that four line um, or, or four or five line because you get another quad one opportunity, but you miss two of them. Uh, if you went out, like, all of a sudden, yeah, you got you definitely would probably be a three seed at that point. But a lot of opportunity here left uh, to, to get some momentum, most of all going into the postseason, feel good about what you're doing going into the postseason but also potentially move up a seed line. Because right now they look pretty locked into that four fives uh, right now. Four probably where you're at now. Five might be your floor. 
but uh, this is the urgency, right? This is where, where Brad talks about the the what was it, the quickness of the end, the finality of the abruptness end, of like, the end. abruptness yeah, of the end. Yeah. yeah, like this is this is where you got to feel it. This is where these seniors you shouldn't have to coach that out of them anymore. Right. Yeah, it should be pretty natural to come come about and come and permeate through that locker room. And you hope that the leadership is is there from those guys that are in that position then to to trickle down to some others uh, that that you know have multiple years left. But just to know that what this team's capable of, what's still on the table, three quad one opportunities is huge. You know, especially the the one I know you're not looking ahead too much if you're the team, um, but the Purdue one. I mean, that's a that's not only a quad one, that's a high end quad one that can really move the 1A. needle if you're yep, quad one A for sure. Uh at Wisconsin would be a pretty good win. Although I know that they're not playing all that well of late. So uh that's that's kind of staying that a little bit, but um for sure if they win three or four, particularly, you know, at least two of those being quad ones, you put yourself in a in a good spot to still have a three in consideration. Of course, it'll matter what Matt what happens for those teams above you. I know that maybe a line of fans should be encouraged that Duke, I think, who was on that three line lost today to Wake Forest. It's one of those, it's that time of year and it gets fun where you're, you're starting to watch the teams around you. Number one, it's good to be in the field watching teams around you instead of watching other bubble teams. Do they lose? Okay, where we go? Uh, that that type of thing. But uh, to see what those squads on the three line, how they finish their years. But um, then you go to the Big Ten tournament and maybe you're playing a quad one on a Friday and and with a chance, really, if you're the number two team, you'd be expected to make it to, to Sunday against Purdue probably for a rematch. But uh, lots still to play for. Should be fun to go down the stretch. And But it does start with Minnesota, a team that is is feisty. And um, if you don't bring it, Dawson Garcia, Elijah Hawkins can give you some issues. Not a team you should lose to at home. But uh, we've not. seen Illinois uh, <laughs> have some issues at times with, with teams they shouldn't lose to. But also, Derek, if you went out in the Big Ten, you might still have a chance because one of those would include Purdue. Maybe you get Michigan State to take care of business against Purdue or something like that. That is still in play potentially. Uh, they play in, Wisconsin in again too? Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Like they got some tough games. Purdue does coming up one tough game. They do not have uh, the Michigan is this week for, for Purdue. That is that is not a tough game for them. Anyway, that'll wrap it up. Almost an hour here after Illinois beats Iowa 8-95-85. to Huge game from Coleman Hawkins, Nico Moretti, Justin Harmon. Thank you for all for listening to the Online Enquirer podcast. Give us a follow, rating, review wherever you get your podcast. More than 400 people at a time here on the live YouTube channel. We love all you guys. Thanks for that. Uh, hit the like button on your way out. Subscribe to us. Hit the notifications bell as well. We got plenty coming up at Illini Enquirer from this game. Joey writing about Nico. He's excited about that. I'm writing about Coleman. Derek will have his takeaways. We'll have player grades uh, and some more following up from this big win for Illinois. Everybody have a great day. Take care of each other. We'll talk to you next time on the Illini Enquirer podcast.